you know, that if my prayer wasn't answered, then it was probably because, you know, I overslept and didn't have a proper quiet time, or maybe I'd used some bad language at some stage, or perhaps even I had indeed committed the unforgivable sin. Uh, and all that continued. It was exhausting being a Christian when you felt you were just one sin away from God's displeasure and his wrath. That all changed uh, one day when I heard a series of talks, three talks, by a man talking about eternal security. And one of those three talks was actually called Problem Passages. He went into it in such detail. And after those three very, very detailed talks, I began to feel that actually I might one day make it to heaven. I might be saved. Uh, and that radically changed my Christian walk. Um, I remember this particular Bible teacher quoting Romans 8, 38. I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither height nor depth nor any powers, neither, neither uh, uh, anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing in life or death. I bet that began, man, I began to think, well, maybe salvation is Jamie-proof. You know, maybe not even I can blow it. You know, maybe has God really has got me in the palm of his hand and not even I can escape from his love. And I began to relax and just enjoy my Christian walk. Now then, this brings me on very neatly to Philippians 2.12. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What on earth does that mean? You know, it's up to us, is it? You know, fear and trembling. We might fall off the edge of the precipice and into hell at any moment. You know, what, what is Paul saying here? Well, I think it's very important that we realize that actually to Paul, there are three distinct salvations. There is a past salvation of our spirits. There is a present salvation of our souls. That is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And I tip a hat to Colin Urquhart for, for teaching me that. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. And then there's the future salvation of your bodies. And so just to illustrate this, Ephesians 2.8, it says, doesn't it, that by grace you have been saved, not by works, not by, by faith, and this not your own, and not by works so that no one can boast. In other words, your works are actually a consequence of your salvation, not the reason or cause of your salvation. So, hallelujah, we have been saved. Our spirits are safe with God. Then there's a present salvation. Uh, Colossian, uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1 says, uh, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but those who are being saved. So there's a present salvation going on. And this, this works out by us keeping short accounts with God, living in fellowship with him. 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Just walk, keep short accounts with God. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, judge yourself that you be not judged. In other words, there's a sort of daily getting right with God. I remember, I, I know, Rod, you were a mountain climber at one stage, weren't you? Every time you go up the sort of cliff face, you have to... To, to bang in whatever you call it, a little peg of some description. Yeah, that's it. And, um, and it's like that every day, isn't it? You just sort of get, get, get right with God today. Have I done any sins? 1 John 1, 9. Let me just get this established now before I go on to the next day. And you're sort of climbing up this, this wonderful, exciting mountain that I wouldn't go anywhere near. Uh, thank God for people like Rod who are completely mad and daring and used to do stuff like that. But anyway, so... This is what it is. I'll work out our salvation day to day. And then there's a future salvation of our bodies, Romans 13, 11. Our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. One day we'll have that glorious salvation of our bodies. We'll get those resurrection bodies in heaven. And I often tell patients, or I often used to tell patients that in the practice, you know, you get a new body in heaven. That's an exciting prospect for those who are suffering. So these are the three senses. Question. How do you work out your salvation with fear and trembling? Well, the answer is with effort. Uh, a man called Dallas Willard, the American theologian, said, Grace is opposed to earning, but is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to earning, but it is not opposed to effort. And one hint we get about that in this particular passage here is in verse 12, as you have always obeyed, 
continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, he uses obey and working out your salvation sort of synonymously, that they're the same things. And for each one of us, that's going to look different. There's no one size fits all. You've got to obey what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. And I've got to obey what the Holy Spirit is telling me to do. This is working out our salvation with fear and trembling. Fear and trembling meaning a holy awe, not wanting to offend God in any way because we love him so much. That's what fear is in the biblical sense, just this Holy Spirit-inspired love for God that doesn't want to offend or grieve or quench the Spirit in any way. So, what obedience means will, will be different for each one of us. In the end, uh, we will face judgment. I'm sorry to say that, but it is true. We, even as Christians, will face judgment. Not of us. We have been judged. We were found guilty. The death sentence was passed. Jesus Christ paid it on the cross. Hallelujah, past tense. But what will be judged is our works. And 1 Corinthians 3 talks about how the fact that our works will pass through this fire of judgment. And if it's good, if it's from the Holy Spirit, then it's going to be gold, silver, and precious stones. It will remain. If it's not, if it's just done in the flesh or out of sort of pride or insecurity, then it will be wood and stubble that's burned away. But we ourselves will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. So that's what. That, that's what Paul says about judgment of the works. Does it depend on us, or does it depend on God? Well, both. I want to confess to you that my brother and I, uh, when we were dinghy sailors, which we were when we were kids, we used to go out on a GP14 or a, or a mirror dinghy or a lark or one, some such two, two man sailing dinghy, we always aimed to come second to last. We felt that was a really great place to be. <laughs> And not too much competition, not too much stress, but, you know, we didn't want to come last. That would, that would have been a disgrace to the Muir family. You know, so second to last was fine by us. But I want to tell you that when you're in a dinghy, what moves that dinghy along is the wind. It's the, it's, it's the wind that actually propels it. But it's the skill of the helmsman and the crew to actually trim the sails, trim the center plate, position the boat so that you're actually catching the wind and that sort of optimal way that will propel the boat along. That's why Olympic sailors are so incredible. My brother and I were so useless. But it's, it's the skill, isn't it? So there is a skill in being able to catch the ruach, breath of God in your sails and position yourself. And that comes through being in community, coming to church, through reading the word of God, through prayer, through worship, even through occasional fasting, whatever you want to do, but we, we sort of want to catch the wind of the Spirit and just go for God and do whatever we can for Him. And by the way, there's that gold, silver, and precious stones is not for us. It's to throw at the feet of Jesus, isn't it? It's our crown that we throw at His feet and say, God, you are worthy. I don't want this. It's yours. It's all yours. So that is the, the purpose of the, of the works. Philippians 2, do everything without grumbling and complaining. So this is kind of part two now, you might think when Paul got to this point, he would say, now, the way that you work out your salvation with fear and trembling is not to commit any catastrophic moral failure. You know, that is how you work out your salvation with fear and trembling, or by extreme discipline, you know, the spiritual disciplines. But no, what he actually says is don't grumble or complain. So what, why did he say that? That's a very odd thing to say at this point juncture in his in his narrative so I think the answer is that he knew his ancient history he knew that this was why Israel failed to get into the promised land they grumbled and complained he's actually quoting um, uh, Deuteronomy uh, those two words grumbling and complaining there are three reasons we love to grumble and complain one is for comfort one is for empowering, and the other one is for connection. I just want to sort of cast the net wide here, because some of you may be thinking, well, I'm not much of a grumbler or a complainer. I'm just going to prove you're absolutely wrong, okay? Um, so comfort. It feels good. We, we go through our stressful lives. We have negativity thrown at us from every angle. How do we deal with this negative energy? We grumble and we complain. It's not really whining. You know, whining isn't, isn't socially acceptable. It's not really anger. Anger isn't socially acceptable. But complaining, wow, yeah, that's, that's fine. I mean, just, just read your average 
social, you know, social networking, you know, moan, 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 comment, 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 complain, complain, you know, it's something that we all do. Secondly, it's empowering. We're standing up to something. We're actually getting revenge on the world for being so crowded and expensive and noisy, and for that person who was so rude to me and belittled me, and we're, we're not actually being aggressive, and you know, we're not going to get any, any sort of, uh, we're going to be beaten up for this, but we can get our revenge by complaining. So we come to the end of our day, and we have a good old moan, and it's kind of empowering to get our revenge and stand up to, to life like that. Yeah, yeah. So, connection. It's unifying. It's our way of developing bonds with people. Um, where would small talk be without complaining, for instance, about the weather? I mean, you know, where would we be without complaining about the weather as English people? It's just so humid at the moment. It's just, oh, you know, why is it raining? Why is it sunny? You know, it's so hot. We, we do it to, for connection, don't we? Um, but actually, seriously, we, we do it about the boss, the government. Small talk would be so boring if it wasn't for complaining. It's like sharing a glass of wine with someone or having a meal with them. You're having a good old moan about the government or the boss or your job. That's what we do. It's for connection. But if you think about it, for Christians, those three things, comfort, power, and connection, should really come from our walk with God rather than complaining and arguing and moaning, shouldn't they? We should really be getting comfort and power, empowerment, and, and, uh, uh, and our, our connection through God. One of the most um, challenging obstacles in dealing with this habit uh, is just um, not recognizing the extent of the problem in yourself. Paul says, do everything without complaining or arguing. But that's not a suggestion. That is a command. Do you know what I mean? Just think about that for a second. He's not saying, well, life would be a little bit easier. He's saying, don't do it. You know, do not do it. It's wrong. Um, God says in his word, do everything without complaining or arguing. So, here are four types of people I know. First of all, Victor and Meldrew, these are just people with a negative dispositions. <laughs> I don't believe it. I mean, it sort of comes naturally to me, actually, you know. I don't believe it. It's a sort of um, slightly negative disposition. It's not fair. Why me? Uh, the grass is always greener on the other side. You know, it's just not fair. But if you think about it, life isn't fair, uh, and uh, you're not going to make it any better by complaining about it. The second time is the martyr. No one appreciates me. Um, even Moses was tempted down this line. Listen to these words from Moses, Numbers 11, 11. Moses said to the Lord, why pick on me? Why give me the burden of a people like this? Are they my children? Am I their father? Is that why you've given me the job of nursing them along like babies? If you're going to treat me like this, please kill me right now. It'll be a kindness. You know, you can see that Moses is tempted towards this kind of martyr complex, you know. Um, I'll explain why I don't think he actually was in a moment, but uh, nevertheless, you can see the temptation is there. Uh, secondly, the cynic uh, Solomon, nothing ever changes. So um, this is the words of Solomon in Ecclesiastes. In my opinion, nothing is worthwhile. Everything is futile. What does a man get for all his hard work? Generations come and go, but it makes no difference. It's all been done before. There's nothing new under the sun. Mothers, have you ever reached this point with your children's bedrooms? It's just pointless. I, mean, I give up. I, there's, no, there's no point in me saying anything. You know, it's not going to change. Well, I mean, extrapolate that, and we can get like that with God. We can get like that about healing or some pastoral situation. It's no good. I don't know why we bother praying. Nothing ever changes, you know. So, you know, I've prayed and prayed and prayed, and, you know. So you can get this sort of cynical way with, even with God, even with your faith. Nothing is going to change. We can carry on praying to a blue in the face and you just start to allow that cynicism to sink in. And finally, the perfectionist, is that the best you can do? No. I mean, nothing is quite right, is it? I had a French master whose, uh, whose uh, catchphrase was less than perfect will not do. But it may have sort of you know, been motivating for some, but for me, I gave up French the very millisecond that I could. You know, less than perfect will not do. I was obviously a failure. So, uh, so I just quit. Uh, and sometimes perfectionists can have that effect on people. Let's go on to the cure. Uh, so as a doctor, I sometimes 
I'm heavy on diagnosis because actually without the diagnosis you're not going to get the right treatment so apologies for going through the diagnosis but I think we're now all on the same card you know we're we're all in this complainers anonymous group together you know let, let's what are we going to do about this you know we all do it what are we going to do first of all recognize it has serious consequences um, Deuteronomy 32 32 5 grumbling and complaining is exactly the sin of the people of Israel they grumbled and complained it's the reason they never entered the promised land secondly recognize that it is sin Exodus 16 8 you're not grumbling against us but against the Lord the Israelites were actually complaining not really against Moses they were actually complaining against God himself now there's a wonderful passage that may have escaped your notice in Acts 17 Acts 17 26 which tells us that God determines the times set for us and the exact places where we should live the exact places where we should live he has determined your neighbor yes that difficult neighbor you know that that one that you find so hard to deal with he's determined it you know he's determined your boss uh, he's determined that that job that is so difficult and impossible infuriating he's determined all of that for a reason and when Janet was preaching she was talking about sometimes prayers are not seemingly answered the way we want because God is working out things for his glory and I think we have to just accept that sometimes it's not all plain sailing sometimes God gives us challenges in life because he is actually trying to mold us and mold our characters I've never been a slab of clay in my life have you no but actually we have you know because God is the potter and we're the clay but I imagine if I was a slab of clay having someone's thumbs dug into me and sort of whirled around on a pot would not be the world's most comfortable experience you know and I think sometimes God does that to us you know here's the potter we're the clay sometimes he's going to dig his thumbs into our lives he's going to twirl us around make us dizzy and he's going to do things and fashion us into something that he wants for his glory and that is not going to be comfortable believe me no, none of us like change you know so why is he doing this so thirdly so that's recognize that it can be serious it can actually have serious consequences as far as not getting into the promised land it, it's it's a sin it's actually complaining against God thirdly it's a slippery slope uh, if you think about it it's ingratitude and ingratitude in Romans 1 was the slippery slope for humanity although they knew God they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him but in their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were dark and although they claimed to be wise they became fools God gave them over to their sinfulness so actually complaining is really not only sin it's ingratitude which is the slippery slope it's actually the beginning of the end, isn't it, as far as humanity is concerned. David Powell, the New Testament scholar, when we're ungrateful, we fail to recognize God's wisdom, fail to recognize God as God. We grow entitled and accuse God of withholding things from us. Hebrews 3 says they did not enter the promised land because of their unbelief. They just didn't believe God enough. Guys, we've got a promised land here in Whitchurch, and that is to see revival come to Whitchurch that's our promised land that's where we want to enter into that's where I want to enter into to see the Holy Spirit poured out on people the, the job of the Holy Spirit is to convict of sin and righteousness and judgment as a congregation let's not grieve quench or resist the Holy Spirit let's just be a people who God can just flow through and into this town and do all that he wants to do in this town he's got thousands of people we know that he wants saved in this town this is God's will that all men should be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth it's a fact he wants everyone to be saved let's not do anything that can grieve quench or resist to stop us entering into our promised land of seeing this place this building filled two or three times on a Sunday because God's Spirit has just been unleashed on this town because we're not grumbling or complaining we're moving in faith we're moving uh, in, in his blessing it says here do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation then you will shine does that remind you of a word 
like beacon. We can shine. We can shine like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. So back to the final thing. So we've won. It's, it's got serious consequences. Two, uh, it's, it's a sin. It's actually unbelief. Three, it's an ingratitude. It's the slippery slope away from God. Number four, we can choose instead of complaining to worship God. So Paul finishes here. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice, the drink offering was the completion of the sacrifice of who? Of Paul himself. You remember in Philippians, he said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. For all he knew, he was waiting for the death sentence to come. So here he was in prison, awaiting possible death, either in Caesarea or Rome, and just saying, God, I, I love you so much, I don't care, I just want everything to be a sacrifice of praise to you. Some of us who were here three or four weeks ago, maybe longer, when we heard about Helen Bahani, do you remember the Eritrean a lady who was trapped in a container in the middle of the Eritrean desert. She had two and a half years in prison for, for, for spreading her faith. And at one point, she was put in a container out in the desert. The temperature was excruciatingly hot, so hot, she said that you couldn't lie down. Uh, the, the teenagers were fainting. The old people were thinking they were going to die. She herself was asked, what, what are we going to do about this? All the people in the container, what was her answer? Do you remember? Yeah. Worship God for the heat. She led them in a song of worship for the heat. And somehow the guards thought, what are those people in that container making all that racket for? And she was rescued. So just praising God. It's so like what happened in the Philippians. Do you remember the outset of Philippians in Acts 18? What were Paul and Silas doing in prison? They were worshiping. Thank you, God, for this prison. It's great. This is tremendous. We're in prison. Whoa. You know, and, and suddenly there was an earthquake, they were released, the prisoner got saved, the Philippian church was just established. This is just Paul through and through and through. Why was Paul like that? I'll tell you. The cross. The cross. Paul absolutely was aware of his sin. Do you remember him saying to Timothy, 1 Timothy, he says, you know, this is a trustworthy saying. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. It was kind of like on every chromosome of his DNA. You know, I, I am the worst of sinners. That is why he was able to pray, praise because he knew what he deserved. He deserved death. But in fact, what did he get because of Christ's resurrection, his death and resurrection? He got forgiveness. He got eternal life. He got adoption into the family of God. So Paul was someone who just was living with that absolute present day reality that he was the worst of sinners he deserved a lot worse than what he was getting in fact he was actually on a mountaintop because he'd been adopted as a child of God and had eternal life waiting for him so Paul was kind of bubbling up with praise virtually the entire time no matter what his circumstances were so we may be facing trouble serious medical condition bereavement something about our housing situation a very frustrating job, severe financial difficulties. Maybe it's your singleness or maybe it's a difficult marriage. Whatever it is we're facing, I'm sure they're valid, valid reasons. I'm sure that they're valid reasons for you to feel actually life is really tough at the moment. I need grace, but God is able to give us grace. Even in the valley of the shadow of death, he is with us. His rod and staff, they comfort us. He leads us beside still waters and in green pastures. He restores our soul. And when all is stripped away, clue for the way we're going to finish the service, when all is stripped away, actually sometimes it's in those moments that our praise is the most authentic. So, Thursday, I knew I was going to find this difficult. Thursday, a week ago, I had a phone call. Josh is, um, he was a paramedic. Josh has been in a very serious accident. He's being airlifted to Stoke. You better come down quickly. So I got in the car, Darlington, drove for two and a half, three hours down to Stoke, just not knowing what I was going to find. And uh, during that time, I found it really difficult to pray. I was so confused, you know. What, what am I going to find? You know, I was just really 
difficult to pray. I could pray in tongues, and sometimes that's the best thing you can do in a situation like that, just pray in tongues when you just don't understand what's happened. But one thing I did find it incredibly easy to do was worship. Just found that absolutely natural because suddenly God was the only unshakable thing in my life. You know, I knew that he was unshakable for me. He was completely unshakable for Josh. And I knew that to be a total reality in that moment. And as I was driving down, I listened to a song by Michael W. Smith. Um, This is how I fight my battles. And there's this particular line in there. This is how I fight my battles. It says, I may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. And I thought, that is wonderful. Josh may look like he's surrounded, but he's surrounded by God. He's surrounded by prayer. He's surrounded by the church of Jesus Christ. Isn't that absolutely easy? It was so true. I can't tell you how many of you were praying. You know, Beacon were just phenomenal, absolutely incredible. And it's the moments like that you just find, yes, Christ has been made head of the church, which is the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And suddenly you just feel like everything in every way is the church. You know, you just feel bombarded by the love of your fellow Christians. Not, you know, it's just not just Beacon, but other people were praying all, all over the nation. It was just fabulous. So, John Wesley, uh, nothing in life, nothing in death can separate us from the love of Christ. John Wesley apparently died quoting uh, Isaac Watts' hymn, uh, I'll praise my maker while I breath, and when my voice is lost in death, praise shall employ my nobler powers. John Wesley, what a great way to go. I'll praise my maker while I breath, and when my soul is lost in death, praise shall employ my nobler powers. Nothing in life or death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Let's not be complainers, okay? Let's not be complainers. Let's not be fair weather friends of God. Friends when all things are going well, when you're on the mountaintop, but in the valley, yeah, we start complaining about him. You know, it's not wrong. By the way, lament is not wrong. I should make this clear. The Bible encourages us to lament. What's the difference? Lament is when you're actually involving God. You're not complaining about him. You're kind of (laughs) lamenting to him. God, life is so tough. This is so impossible. This is so difficult. This is why I'm letting Moses off the hook, you know, when he was going on with his martyr complex, because actually he was doing it to God, which is okay. It's okay to lament. In the the Psalms, we find David again and again being brutally honest with God. You know, you're allowed to do that. You're allowed to say to God, I love you so much, God, but this is so tough. You know, would you, what are you up to? What are you playing at? You know, please make this easier for me. You know, you're allowed to to go on at God. God encourages it. I love it in the Alpha Course. If, you, if you've done the Alpha Course, there's this bit where there's, a, there's a, a monk who says he always starts his quiet times by complaining to God. <laughs> I thought that was lovely. You know, he has a good old rant. You know, God, I'm really in a bad mood today. You know, that's how he starts off his quiet time. That's okay. You're allowed to lament. But it's actually when you find yourself kind of behind God's back, you know, I think God's just not on the scene here. He's not answering our prayers. You know, you know you, let's not let's avoid that. Let's involve God in what we're, whatever we're going through because we love him. We don't understand him at times, but we love him. So two questions. What type of complainer am I? What kind of complainer are you? Uh, and number two, what would life be if our complaining stopped right here, right now? What, what difference would that make to our lives, to our families' lives, to our church, and to this town and to our nation? So let's, let's pray. Um, I'm, I'm watching the clock, yeah. Ken, we're okay. I just thought it'd be good to give us an opportunity to respond uh, in, in faith. So if you, if you feel, God, I just feel I am a bit sort of culpable here, I'm a bit guilty, I do give myself to complaining every now and again. If you feel like that, perhaps you'd like to just raise your hand, I'm not going to, I'm going to close my eyes, raise your hands, and let's just, let's just say, okay, you can put them down again, let's just respond. Father, we, we just pray that you would forgive us, Father, if at times we find ourselves saying negative things, maybe to other people, just burdening them with our arguing, complaining, grumbling. Lord, we just remember that that, that is sin. It's, it's actually serious consequences. It's, it's ingratitude. 
And Lord, we just pray you'd forgive us. Lord, we want to, 1 John 1, 9 this, we want to say, Lord, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Father, we just determine now, Lord, that we want to live lives that are full of gratitude to you, full of praise, praise being the antithesis, the answer, the solution, the treatment for this. So we just pray you'd fill our lives with praise. When life gets difficult, give us the grace that we need. Lord, to to give you praise and to honor you and to love you through thick and thin. In Jesus' name, amen.